This is the Creative Creative, a podcast of authentic discussion with industry pros. Yeah. Well, anyway, so thanks for 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 being on today. How about how about you hit us with your name? If you've got websites, what's your title? What's going on, man? Cool. Hi, I'm Alex Zacon. Um, my website is creatively enough, alexacon.com. Um, I have an Instagram as well, Alexander underscore Zacon. Um, and I am currently a freelance video editor slash animator slash motion graphics slash video production. Let me jump right on that because I because I have a relatable experience. I've done I've been a video editor for a long time, but video editing is not just video editing <laughs> anymore. Nope. <laughs> How the hell do we articulate the, all the, these multi-threat additional skills that are now under editing, but aren't editing? Right, yeah, that's something, you know, to use the term, I kind of don't like this term, but it's fitting, multi-hyphenate. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, editor, animator, director, sound designer, whatever, blah, blah, blah. So I think, it's, I don't know, I don't have a good answer because I always struggle to say that as well. I usually, for people that aren't in the industry, I'll just say, I'm in video, or I'm a okay. video producer, even though I don't produce. <laughs> yeah. Um, just because it's, I feel like it's confusing to say all these things one after another. It sounds superfluous. But it's true. It is the demand is getting more and more um, to know more skills. Like recently at this gig I've been doing, I was hired as the editor, but I've been having to do motion graphics. I did a color mix uh, or color correction and a sound mix. So I'm doing the finishing work as well. Um, and that's something I never really learned mm -hmm. to how to do. You know, I never learned how to correctly do color correction. I can kind of do it, but I, I would not dare call myself a colorist. Were you doing that in Resolve or just adjustment layers in Premiere? So that, that's the thing. I started off just doing adjustment layers in Premiere. But some of it, I needed to use Resolve. And I'd actually never used Resolve before. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, and so that was kind of a crazy learning experience because this was a freelance gig. And I'm kind of learning on the job, which, you know, it always feels a little weird when they bring you in to do something and you're like, oh, I don't know if I can actually do this. Um, but it ended up working out pretty well. Picked up a little bit of Resolve. Um, and... I learned more, so it kind of worked out well. Do you feel like when when you get into situations where people hire you for, and, and you know, you you can dodge the question if if, if it puts you too close to something, but uh, do you feel like when when you get asked to be a video editor, um, and then they go, oh, hey, so video editor, can you also do all the sound design on our thing? Do you ever feel like you're comfortable saying no, I can't do that, or do you always feel that little bit of extra pressure if I say no, I get fired? Yeah, no, I think I, at first, I felt really weird about saying no, but I've learned that you just got to be honest and manage the expectations in the beginning. So, like, for this gig, I did know going into it, they up, they were upfront about it. They were like, hey, uh, can you do color and sound mix? And I was honest. I said, I can do, you know, a rudimentary version of it. I'm not a colorist. I'm not a sound designer but I can do a rough version. And, and we basically came to the agreement like, okay, we'll have you do the rough version and if we're not happy with it, we can pass it on to a colorist and a sound mm -hmm, designer. Mm -hmm. uh, and it turned out they were happy with what I did, so it all worked out. Oh, but great. I think it's important to just be clear about it up front. You know, I didn't outright say, no, I don't do that. I was open to trying it out, but I also wanted to manage their expectations and not be like, oh, I'm an expert colorist and sound yeah, designer. Yeah. Well, okay, so I know that like on your Instagram, um, you're doing a whole lot of Cinema 4D and animation work right now. Yeah. Um, is that something that, that you do just as a passion? Is that something you want to grow into where it's like you're switching over from being an editor to becoming an animator and motion graphic artist? Like, like what, what it, or is it just personal satisfaction? What's the play on that? Yeah, that's, that's kind of tricky. I would like to, I think, do it more professionally um, because so far it's just kind of been a hobby. Um, and the thing is, especially with 3D, the more I learn about it, the more I realize I don't know. <laughs> so I feel really unqualified. <laughs> and this is actually a common theme I've talked to with other people and, you know, imposter syndrome where mm -hmm. you feel like, oh, I'm not good enough to get hired to do this thing, so I'm not going to try um, so I haven't actually really been seeking out any 3D work yet. I feel mm -hmm. like I still need to develop the skill set. 
but I have had opportunities. I uh, used to work at BuzzFeed, and we can talk more about that yeah. later. But uh, I did have some opportunities there to kind of throw in some little 3D animations into some of the videos I worked on. Yeah, I mean, watching your Cinema 4D work is really inspiring because um, I've been, uh, when, when I was in college, I think R11 was what was out. And at that time, I had to spend so much of my time learning Creative Suite 4 with Photoshop, Premiere, and After Effects. Or not Premiere, Final Cut 7. You know, it was, mm. it was After Effects, Final Cut 7, and Photoshop. Um, that Premiere, or Cinema was over there, and I was like, okay, I'm going to open this up. I'm going to learn some things. I even took a couple courses in it. But it's so big because <laughs> it, 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 it threw me for a fucking loop when it, it kind of registered with me that if I have video clips in, in my editing software, so many decisions are already made. The lighting is done, <laughs> the camera placement yep. is done, the point of focus is done, the composition is done, and the general idea is done. The, the blank canvas in 3D is so different than the blank canvas in everything else. I, it felt like it took me years to understand just how to get render settings semi decent. Just that alone, yep. You know, because it's like, you know, I'm, I'm I've been like you is where it's like you don't get paid for it. So it's whenever all the paid work is done, then you've got to collect your emotional energy, your creative energy, and then launch something else, and then go and do really hard work where you don't know things. <laughs> so like, how how has that worked out for you? Because 3D has always been super, super daunting from my mindset. And seeing folks like you and other people in Austin that keep chipping at it and pushing at it is really exciting to watch. Because whether it's coming easier or not, like you got everybody else seems to be moving faster. So like, like how, do, how, does, how, how does that practice and that drive into new skills work for you? So yeah, I think a big part of it actually, and this sounds kind of weird, but Instagram honestly has weirdly been a big inspiration and motivation for me. Um, and you know, there's the whole kind of dual, uh, double-edged sword with that, you know, where it can be both motivating and demotivating. You know, like you see artists like Beeple Mm -hmm. that are creating an insane, amazing piece of work every day, nonstop, for 10 years. Um, and and nothing I've ever made has been close to anything he's made. And he just, you know, busts it out in a day. <laughs> uh, but then it's also inspiring, you know, to show that consistence, cons consistency is rewarded. And, <clears throat> and Instagram kind of forces me to actually finish things mm -hmm. um, and have, like... Um, an end goal for it you know what I mean because a lot of the times before I had started posting stuff I would just start something like maybe trying a new effect like okay I'm gonna try a cloth simulation and I'd get part of the way through and then be like yeah whatever and then just abandon it and never touch it again mm -hmm. when there's an end goal it kind of forced me to actually finish it um, because like okay I want to have something to post I want to actually show what I've been working on so it would force me to spend more time than I would have and actually delve deeper and learn more about the thing I was trying to do. So I think that really helped. Um, but even at a certain point, Instagram can only get you so far because you're only doing these, for the most part, short little blips. So I think the next step is I want to make like a short, a cohesive short film. And, and that's the, there's the thing with the, a lot of people are doing these every days. And I think you sort of hit this fall off where you're sort of not learning a whole lot as much as you mm -hmm. were and you have to channel it into a more like a narrative piece yeah um, yeah because most if you do get a job doing some kind of 3d it's probably not going to be a weird little instagram render they're going to want a fully fleshed out project yeah do you, do you think that there's the that because whenever you see on instagram 3d artists like people or or even uh there's uh, there's fuck render that's mm -hmm. that's out there and a couple other really cool people they're doing these intensely creative artistic pieces yeah do you think that that is that, that that's analogous to the paid work that they're doing where where the paid work is also equivalently creative or is it like they do this wild wild shit and then they just do like a 3d render of a credit card for visa <laughs> like I think it I think it really it depends because in some cases it is like that like they're doing their own creative stuff as an outlet because they don't get to do it and the paid gigs because as a lot of people in the industry know the 
generally the better paying stuff is the more boring stuff. Yeah, it's like the the more the mo- the more money you get, the duller the work. Yeah, is. yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and you are gonna probably the your highest paying gig is gonna be rendering a credit card, you know. <laughs> um, but I think there's also something that I've heard a lot of these artists say, and I think it is a good sentiment: is do the work you want to get paid to do. Mm-hmm. So even if you're not getting paid for it to start with. You're not going to get paid to do it unless you have that work to show. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's part of another reason why I started doing this 3D stuff on my own time is to have kind of build up a reel so that I could eventually get paid to do that kind of work. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that's why I want to make a full short, maybe a music video um, to have on my reel that I can shop around and be like, can I make this for you? Something like this. And maybe try to get more work that way. Because you're not going to find this crazy, cool, artistic, trippy work doing the credit card renders, you know? <laughs> right, right. So, like, I, I know you've done some agency work, um, you know, just when I first met you, you were at an agency in town. Mm-hmm. Um, when you were doing your, your, your practice work, do you, do you sit down in front of the computer and just go? Or do you take some of that agency process where it's like, I want to have an idea, I want to have an intent, and I want to have it look a certain way or be, like... What, what's that what's that feel like for you or or do you or does it not even matter it kind of depends i feel like a lot of times i will just sit down with the blank canvas 3d mm-hmm. canvas and sometimes it can lead somewhere but i think a lot of times it doesn't really lead anywhere i just kind of sit around i'll make a cube and spin it around a couple times and then just feel uninspired and close cinema for me. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I've had the most success when I either, one of two ways, I'll either try to make uh, a t- something from a tutorial. I'll follow a tutorial on YouTube. Do you literally follow it or do you try and do your own spin on it as you go? So I'll, I'll start off following it and kind of get the basics. Like say they're doing soft body dynamics, right? Mm-hmm. So I'll, I'll kind of follow along with it once, just do it exactly as they're doing. And then I'll start a new project and try to use what I just learned, but in a new way. Because I, you can definitely see when someone's just followed a tutorial and done that exact thing. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. there's some tutorials that are, you know, pretty popular. And I've definitely seen people that will post something that, yes, they made it, but they're just following the tutorial and it looks exactly the same. And it's a little frustrating to see that. <laughs> so I, I try to change it and make it my own as much as possible, but it at least gives me a starting point, you know, like, okay, for this, I'm going to be using soft body dynamics. It gives you some kind of technique mm-hmm. or tool or whatever to use just to start things off. Um, so either I'll try to do that or I will have an idea of what I want to make or like a type of style. Sometimes I'll just look at a, a color palette mm-hmm. and be like, I'm going to use these colors. But I, I find it helps to have something, you know, like no matter how small, even if it's just like, oh, I found this cool free 3D model, I want to throw it into a scene. Um, that helps too. And you just need some kind of kernel, some kind of grain, rather than absolutely nothing. That's really hard to get jump started with. Yeah, and you, you know, when, when I was talking with Kagan on one of the earlier episodes, one of the things that was really impressive to me was when I was asking him kind of a similar question. He's like, oh, no, I just sit down and go. <laughs> yeah. She's like, man, <laughs> like I can do that with some things in Photoshop. And that's about it. And it's just like for him to sit down into cinema and just go and then turn it into the, the complexity that he does for his shows. Uh, I, I found that to be quite impressive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kagan is on another level. <laughs> he really is. Um, and also with you know, he really knows the program. And with I think when you really know everything that you can do in it, it it helps you create. Um, you know, like when I was first starting off, you have no idea. Like literally, I made a cube. What can I do with this cube? I don't know. But now I'm like, okay, I see all the possible tools and things you can do to manipulate the cube. So mm-hmm. the more you know, it, it kind of frees you up more to make whatever you want. Yeah, that was actually uh, the, the starting with the cube and then kind of learning from there. When I was in college, like the, the first cinema exercise was make a couch. Mm-hmm. And then it was like make a couch like five different ways. So it'd be like you start with the cube and it's like, well, you can, you can kind of slice it up and move 
move the points and, and the planes around so you know it looks like a seat and then it's like you can do it with a boolean you can do it with nerves and then you know now you have to start adding detail you know get color it make sure there's legs for the couch get some folds where where you can actually see the cushions tuck in make those different things as different objects so you've got your frame of the couch and the cushions are independent and and then your seam can be like like a, a spline that wraps around it uh, and that's about as far as I got where it's like, oh shit, this is huge. I got to get back to video. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's so, I still have that a lot. You know, I still feel like a beginner with 3D where I, I just get totally overwhelmed. And because each aspect of it is an entire discipline of its own. Yeah. Like modeling, rigging, animating, lighting, rendering. Each one of those, you can spend a lifetime just learning. Right. So right. when you're trying to learn everything, it's crazy. It's like you're an entire crew. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to do the job of everyone on the crew. Like you were saying earlier, there's so many components to it. Do you think, do you think that 3D artists are, are kind of, and I know we're both kind of playing in the space, uh, but do you think 3D artists are kind of suffering that same kind of collapse that video is, where it's like, maybe you started out in modeling, but now, dude, can you just do it all? Because <laughs> uh, it seems like that's happening to all the different roles in creative professions right now. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I was talking with some friends that are in agencies, and this kind of seems to be a universal thing where agencies are getting smaller, um, studios are getting smaller because they're expecting less people to do more work. And it's it's kind of, I don't know, for me, it's it's good and bad. It's, it's good because I like doing a lot of different things, mm -hmm. um, and I have interest in a lot of different things. Like, I wouldn't want to just be a video editor forever. I like kind of being able to do some motion graphics and right. even sound mixing and, and some color and do some stuff that I am I'm learning new things and I like that. But at the same time, it almost devalues the skill set. Like yeah. have you ever like you're saying, like sometimes you'll get a project, like I got a, a 3D project once, just a, a small thing, and it was like, oh, it started off as like, can you just do this little thing? And it's like, oh, and add like a city and all this stuff and and like it just got bigger and bigger because people just don't know what actually goes into it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, that scope creep is so insidious because I've definitely sat around and, and, and been with people and made the legitimate argument. I'm a better video editor for knowing sound design because that makes, because if I can, if, if I am smart enough to be able to manipulate the audio and not have to send that off to somebody else and have it come back, but I can do it on my timeline or in the application right alongside my edit, my timing is better. My moments of impact are more meaningful. By being able to be knowledgeable about motion design, I can bring in the supers in a more effective way. I can be a lot more thoughtful about the overall composition and where the lower third sits and how that's designed. Uh, so I see a lot of value in, in the convergence of these skills. But I sure as shit haven't seen the rates go up. Yeah, <laughs> yep. That's the issue. That's the issue is that people are expecting more but want to pay the same or yeah, less. <laughs> it's like I'm doing two jobs. You don't have to pay me twice as much scale of economy, mm -hmm. but like 1.5. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <you know? laughs> Just a little extra. Yeah, it's yeah. got to go up something. <laughs> um, let's see here. What else is 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 fun? Um, you were, you were saying we should talk about BuzzFeed later. later. Let's, let, so you did a run at BuzzFeed in Austin mm -hmm. while they existed in Austin. <laughs> yes. What was that like? Yeah, so that was, that was really interesting. Um, so yeah, before that I was at an ad agency and uh, I was just kind of a little tired of working in ads. I'm sure people that work in ads can relate. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I was just looking for something new and I saw that BuzzFeed was opening an office in Austin. So I said, why not? I applied. And the position was, was like a video producer uh, or a creative video producer. Mm -hmm. And the description was like, you'll be filming, editing, etc. So not really a producer position, but still. Uh, it was a video position. So I applied. The predator thing. Yeah, the producer, exactly. Yeah. Producer editor. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I applied and I ended up getting it. And it was, it was interesting because the Austin office of BuzzFeed was a satellite office, right? The main offices are New York and LA. And we had a very small office. It was in a co-working space. And there's only about eight of us. And so it was sort of a strange position where it was part of this very large company, 
but had the feeling of a small office work environment. Mm-hmm. That's kind of the best um, of both worlds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was it was really cool. And one thing that was interesting uh, about about BuzzFeed, and again, my experience may be different because in the Austin office, um, but they really were open to having people try different things. And this goes back to the whole what we were just talking about about people being expected to know everything. Mm-hmm. Um, it was sort of that, but in a kind of in a good way it was more like we don't expect you to know any everything but you're welcome to try different things so it's like you know you can here's the wall throw pasta yeah, yeah exactly exactly just yeah. like here you go you want to try something we understand you're not an expert in it but just go for it and maybe we'll learn from the experience so that was really cool that's um, really healthy yeah, yeah yeah it was um and i think that is a lot of what helped them as a company is like they're super open to uh, people trying new things, and one thing I noticed in the, in the ad agency is it's very uh, people are very siloed in their positions. You know, it's like if you're a writer, you're only a writer. If you're a designer, you're only a designer, etc. So, but sometimes you have a writer who likes to design or a designer who likes to write, and they can bring new ideas. So in BuzzFeed, there was like that kind of that culture of like. If you want to do something, go for it. You know, yeah. like I, for example, I, so I'm not really an illustrator. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think this is a common thing with a lot of motion designers is they're not always great illustrators. <laughs> like, and it's, you'd think that people in animation could draw, but I can't really draw. <laughs> no, it's a, it's, it's a dead skill. Like, like when I was in college, I, my, my minor was in fine arts and, and I took a lot of drawing classes and it was it was really really difficult because the the educators who were good artists had sort of lost their understanding of how to communicate or transmit that training so it was a lot of just sit down and go learn through osmosis and repetition it's like that's that that was so different from all the rest of my education at the time it didn't click and so i left college not knowing how to draw and <laughs> right. then you talk to animators all the time and they're like you're supposed to know how to draw none of them know how to draw <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i felt like kind of insecure about it until yeah. i met a bunch of other people that also couldn't draw anyway so i i can't really draw but um i tried out making some comics for the buzzfeed comics page just you know simple kind of did it in illustrator cute little flat design type stuff um, and there, everyone was like totally cool with it. They're like, yeah, sure, you can make comics. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was kind of nice, that environment of like, yes, you can just try things and just go for it, even if it's not your forte or your main specialty. Uh, so that was cool. Um, and then I even went through a period where I was writing, mm-hmm. <laughs> which was bizarre <laughs> because that's not at all what I have a background in. Were you good at it? Uh, I, th- I think I was all right. I had some, yeah, right some trending articles nice. <laughs> on the front page. Um, so that was kind of an odd experience. And I think, again, being in the Austin office, we had even more freedom than the other offices. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were still trying to find out what the office was going to be. So we kind of went through some identity changes of like, what is our focus going to be? Um, and then... In the end, we were just doing video, um, and it was a little hard because we didn't quite have the resources of the LA team, um, you know, because they're in LA, they have this whole video team, they have all this equipment, and we were just a small run and gun team in Austin, so that was a bit of a challenge to keep up with the content that the LA team was making, um, but you know, it was really fun uh, to get to try to do that stuff, uh, but then unfortunately, recently they. Shut down the Austin office. Oops. <laughs> Whoops. Hey, we're so. BuzzFeed. We're out of money. Oops. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there was a big layoff. Yeah. And uh, they shut down a lot of the satellite offices, including ours. So that that was the end of that. And um, yeah, but I, you know, I, I, I'm not bitter. <laughs> it was a really great gig while it lasted. A lot of freedom. Um, work-life balance, too, which yeah. was really nice. Well, I mean, it, I mean... When it's all said and done, you know, for anybody who's who's been working as like a professional creative, it really seems like the marker of whether whether or not you're like in or out, it, it really has a lot to do with like survival and longevity. You know, it's yeah. just whether or not you can keep doing it. So now that now that BuzzFeed is over, I, I know you've been working a couple gigs, but like 
What, what has that been like? Has it been just a lot of in and out of contracts? Has it been pretty stable? Has it been volatile? Uh, are, do, do you have things on your horizon? How are you, how are you managing this unknown that's now kind of come up in your life? Yeah, so, so one thing that's nice about getting laid off is that you get severance. Oh, you lucky fuck. <laughs> or, yeah, I guess you don't always, but, yeah, but that's good. That's great. I got yeah. severance, which is super nice. <laughs> um, so that kind of gave me that little safety net of, mm-hmm. okay, I have a couple months where I, I know I'm, I'm not going to have to worry about making rent. Um, and it kind of freed me up to look for other stuff and do some traveling. Um, so yeah, so right now I, I just wrapped up a long-term freelance gig. Uh, lasted about I guess a month and a half. Um, and I might do another gig with the same company. Uh, but I honestly, I don't really know beyond that. <laughs> I'm kind of, I'm sort of taking this like a while to not really uh, stress too much about it. I'm going to try to travel between freelance gigs. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is a little scary now. And, and that's kind of part of the industry, I think, is you do have that volatility. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if that's even just unique to our uh, discipline anymore. It seems like a lot of other jobs are way less frequent or long. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm, I, you know, because of some of the work that I've done recently, I've been paying a whole lot of attention to uh, LinkedIn as as a social media platform. You know, and I was I was at a meetup the other night, and and they were like, LinkedIn, really? And I was like, <laughs> Yeah, it's like the way Facebook's supposed to be. You know, so there's. It, it, it's really easy to avoid like stupid, toxic political memes. Yeah. It's really easy to avoid dumb teenagers, you know, doing whatever teenagers do where it's just like, you know, high school communication exchanges, which, you know, if you're on Facebook and you've got family members that are young, their, their lives will bubble up into your feeds and all that. Uh, you don't have to deal with family photos and all these other kind of things. And for a while I was trying to like, create a presence on Facebook and then my mom would come around and just take the piss out of me, you know, <laughs> which is, which is great. I love my yeah. mom, but it would be like, th- this doesn't help create a professional presentation. Right. If the comment is from your mom joking about how you did a dumb thing as a teenager. <laughs> yeah. It kind of undermines you. <laughs> well, and, I mean, and, and again, it's family, it's Facebook, yeah. it's your friends. It's, mm-hmm. it's not, it was the first platform that we had to try this stuff. So right. LinkedIn to me has been kind of that more mature, stable, professional space. And it's interesting because um, you're right. It's, it, everything seems both good and cr- incredibly volatile at the same time. Everybody seems to be really satisfied about what they're doing but super uncertain about their future. It's like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, to, to, for, it just feels like everything's weird. Yeah. You know, and I've talked to a couple people where it's like, yeah, my job is good, but everything's weird. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I was, uh, when we, when we, um, when the Austin Motion Artist Group and Brian and I put on the Signal Art Show at the top of South By, I was talking with a couple folks and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll spare their names, but uh, some of them were talking about how where they were, they were getting increasingly less happy, mm. but the money was good, everything was stable, and they couldn't put their finger on what it was. And then when they would look at how they could try and transition out because they were doing job hunts on the sly, good reputations, good skill sets, and it was very, very difficult for them to find equivalency somewhere else right or to go through a job hiring process where it actually connected you know and and i've even been doing that with my own job hunt like getting closing the deal on something that isn't a short-term contract is ridiculously difficult right now yeah it's it's weird i think just a lot of places are shifting from having full-time employees to having contractors or freelancers um, or maybe that's not the case. Maybe it's just that the full time positions are filled, yeah, and, and they're sought after, and nobody wants to give them. No up. one wants yeah. to give it up. Yeah, so people are in it, and they don't want to leave. So the work that you can find is generally going to be contract work, which is crazy because you also hear on the other side is like brands are saying creativity is suffering, agencies feel like they're atrophying. Uh, you know, all of this kind of stuff. You look at ads that are on television or on Facebook that are being programmatically driven to you and they're trash, they're garbage. Yeah. Uh, and it's like, well, okay, if you want better work, 
don't grind your people down. <laughs> yep, yeah. I mean, and hire a few extras. Yeah. You know, if you want, if you want better, pay more. Uh, and and it seems like that's a really hard thing for people to understand. And it's like I I kind of understand. I, I, I appreciated it when we were in the height of the recession. It was like nobody's nobody is spending. You know, mm -hmm. whether you're a big organization or an individual, no one's spending. But like this is supposed to be the good times, and everybody still feels like they're kind of knuckled down and ground under. It's yeah, weird. It is a little weird. I think it's also just part of it has to do with just the the internet and social media and the the change of the media landscape, where companies are not really sure what to do in terms of advertising mm -hmm. um and and budgets are getting smaller you know because it used to be you'd have to drop you know a couple hundred k on a tv commercial and now the new market is going to be a social media ad which is can be way less you know like we that was one thing while i was at buzzfeed at the beginning of our time is we were actually doing branded content um because companies now they want like they come to buzzfeed and they're like oh give us that viral Ad. You know, that's of course like they love that. We're like, let's make it viral, and <laughs> which like, is let me round up my three billion internet friends. Right. <laughs> which, first of all, that ter I think that term is now outdated because stuff doesn't really go viral anymore. Um, in the same way it did, yeah. Uh, just because there's so much stuff out there, it's so saturated. Um, but budgets are a lot smaller for for any kind of content. But there's also way more content, so yeah. I think it's like a bunch of small things rather than one big thing you know people aren't putting all their eggs in one basket they're kind of distributing they're distributing their eggs into smaller baskets my i, I drop my kids off uh at school in the mornings and they go to elementary school that's a pretty short drive from the house but on the ride home i try and pick up a little bit of the local like uh morning djs mm -hmm. you know just just to hear like, be, because in my personal life like i don't consume content on platforms that serve ads i've you know i'm an older millennial so i remember those cable television days and those radio ad days and i fucking hated it <laughs> yep. you know as for as much as that i've worked in creative advertising <laughs> i fucking hate ads yeah <laughs> and i and i desperate to see them evolve because yep. i don't because it, it's a time slot in a really interesting space in people's continuum mm -hmm. and you know, we, we can place ads inside of television shows. We can place ads in between content. We can place ads on the sides of buildings, buses, and everything. And all it says is, fuck you, buy me. Yep. It's like, can we... <laughs> that, Be more creative. That's a huge, huge canvas of opportunity if, if there was less fear in the process. Yeah, and I think part of it, honestly, is... And I experienced this when I was at the agency, is a lot of time you do have that creative creativity there there's people that want to do stuff like that they got into the the industry for a reason they're passionate but a lot of the times it just gets squashed either by someone higher up in the company or the client themselves death that, by a thousand cuts yeah exactly <laughs> totally and and that's that was part of my frustration is like i would be working on you know just a small like 20 second piece and it would go on for more than a month uh because everyone had, wanted to have a say in it. Everyone wanted to cut it and, and change it. And it just totally lost what it, anything that I had originally. Um, and a lot of times the client are, gets scared by something that's new and different. Mm -hmm. And they're like, nope, we don't want to do that. We'll do the same thing we've been doing for the past 30 years. Yeah, yeah. But they want it to go viral. But they want it to go viral. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's like the contradiction. It's like they don't want to try anything new, but they also want it to, to feel like new and fresh. and Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing is that, that so I listen to the radio in the morning after the kids are dropped off just to kind of get myself out of my own personal bubble of avoiding things and and just back into like what there's so many people that don't get heady about this stuff. They just put on the radio in the morning. They don't really think about it. And it's like, even if I'm making a conscious decision, I want to be exposed to the same kind of, I don't have the same mindset, but I want to be exposed to the same stuff. So I'll listen to the radio DJs on the way home. Um, you know, and they'll have their light banter. They'll play a couple top 40 songs. You'll hear a few ads and you go home and go, okay, that's, and then I'll go back into my hipster art space. Yeah. Um, but it was really interesting. They were talking about the new season of Game of Thrones and the, the lead DJ was spending most of his conversation with the others arguing. And, and I think he was actually right 
we will never have a phenomenon like this again. It's like Game of Thrones is like the Beatles for television. <laughs> we will never collectively consume something on this level right. again. And I and and I I think he, they, you know they're they're taking the opposite. You know the other ones were taking the opposite view and cracking jokes the whole thing. But I think he actually had a, like a really good point because uh, Game of Thrones started seven years ago mm-hmm. and and built that momentum mm-hmm. up. R. R. Martin wrote it specifically as a "fuck you, you can't make this." <laughs> and then when they actually pulled it off, that's what was exciting. And in my memory, like you know, and I'm not going to give away details for the show out of politeness, but you know, in my memory, it was like. Season one had a couple big surprises in it, but I don't think people really caught on until about two or three. Yeah. And then it was fucking huge. Mm -hmm. So I wonder about that, especially when people talk about wanting things to go viral, this kind of, this very clear fear of, because I've worked with brand managers of all different varieties on the local and small side of things. Um, and, And I've worked with small businesses and local businesses that, you know, have some spending power. And this, this idea where, where they, they, they want it to be recognizable, they want it to be big, but there's no real financial will to put in that effort, there's no real will on the time to put into it, and all these kind of things is also like very, very present. So it's like, we want to make Yeti films. Well, those are $250,000 a pop, yep. and they take six months. Yep. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> the thing is, like, I wish that people would realize... I think the, there still is room for making things that, I'm not going to say go viral, but do well and are, people like them and will watch them without totally breaking the bank. Mm-hmm. Like, one thing I saw recently, actually, that was really cool was, it was, and this was on Instagram, it was, basically it was a commercial for some kind of little, like, hand-carved wooden ring or something. Um but what was really cool, the way they presented the video was just really interesting. It was like kind of the stop motion, really cool style, cool music. Um, and, you know, just probably one person made it in a couple weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm sure it didn't have a huge budget, but it was really just eye catching and, and original and unique. And it didn't really like shove the product in your face. Like you don't even know it's a commercial until the end where it's like, here's where you can get this cool ring. Yeah, I actually think that there are people, you know, I I have appreciated Instagram ads Mm -hmm. because there are people out there that are trying to make it feel like native content. Right. Um, Yeah, there was, sorry, I flubbed on that lead in. Um, In my own Instagram, I came up to an ad where it was like tough guy jewelry. (laughs) <laughs> uh, for, yeah. for lack of, I mean, it would yeah. be like these skull rings and these, right. you know, chains would be welded into it. And it was, uh, I, I mean, I got the impression that this would be like if you were buying a Harley and going on a road trip with your handlebar mustache <laughs> and your leather jacket, right. this would be the type of jewelry you would buy. A very specific, very intense demographic. Or, and then and then kind of the tale of, tale of that is the people that aspire to it or like to borrow from that subculture. But the ad itself was interesting because it led with like this gritty footage of just like dudes on motorcycles. <laughs> yeah. And so immediately you're like, the fuck is that? <laughs> yeah. I never see motorcycles in my shit. <laughs> yeah. And then they kind of intercut the jewelry making process right. to these tough guys on motorcycles. And then at the very end, um, it, it, you get a logo and halfway through the 30 second ad is when my eyes drop down to the description. Yeah. I'm like, oh, it's sponsored. Yeah. <laughs> and but what was great is they respected that in the description, they could provide the context. Mm-hmm. They they knew that it's going to be flagged as an ad, and they just worked within that piece to make something that was just kind of a catchy little lifestyle bit. Yeah, and I thought that that was kind of cool because when we talk about it, it's like I wish this stuff was more creative. To me, that's more creative than a Tide ad, and and not the Tide ads where it's like the Super Bowl. This is a Tide ad, or right. you know, but but just that generalized like. Our laundry detergent is two times more powerful than <laughs> yeah, the leading brand. I know, like I don't understand wh- how people are still making things like that that are just super to the point. It feels like a '50s commercial. Honestly, like I think we failed. That's my opinion. Um, is that creatives and agencies failed? That somewhere along the, wa- the uh, somewhere along the way, and I think maybe the recession had a big part of it. We got so afraid of losing accounts. We got so afraid yeah. of losing money. We forgot that the job is to articulate and explain to people that don't know this how it works. 
Yeah. We just didn't want to lose our jobs. I think that's also something that isn't really, it's definitely not really taught and not really talked about is you do have to kind of be assertive and, and like be like, yes, I am the expert. This is what you need. But it's hard to do that, you know, like you're saying, without fear of like losing your job or coming off like an asshole. You know, you don't want to be like, no, no, you're wrong. This is how you do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but sometimes that's you kind of have to to sort of suggest things. And yeah, I mean, you don't have to be confrontational about yeah. it. But I do think that we forget that a big part of the job is to convince people. And, and, and I know that this is something that I've been doing more just as an independent. So like with video editing. Um, I've noticed that that like if I just send something to a client that's almost done, I'll be like, what do you think? What I have done is I have not provided context on the trajectory of the video. I mm -hmm. failed to do that. Mm -hmm. And then I failed to ask them for clear feedback. Yeah. I've opened the door for them to tell me whatever the fuck that I want. And I think that I've done that for like nine years because I think that's just what everybody did. Mm -hmm. So what I do now is I typically send them a really crappy assembly cut because mm -hmm. in my own process in premiere i typically make uh like my first timeline sequence is all my selects just sloppy pulled down because premieres shitty about generating sub clips and then i will have a next sequence where i'm taking these things and i'm kind of laying them out in chunks so the first two sequences that i create are stupid lame just finding it mm -hmm. and then the third one down is my like what I would be the equivalent of a legitimate assembly and I bring those things and I drop them and I put all of that together so it's cut 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 I mean in the old days we would have called that a rough cut in today's terms rough cuts are functionally polished mm -hmm. um, yeah. but I then I'll take that and I'll make an export of that and when I get to something that feels like a nearly finished rough cut I'll go this is where we started this is where mm, we are. Yeah. Did I miss anything? Oh, that's nice. And the, the conversations are very, very different now mm -hmm. because it's harder for them to feel like, you, you know, you get to, they, they get the understanding of this is what came out of the camera, right? Because I've, I've, I've removed all of the slop and we're down to the basic structure. Mm -hmm. This is what came out of the camera and this is what the skill turned that into. Yeah. And when they can see that transition, I mean, most CEOs, brand managers, and all these people are not stupid. They're just not literate in the space, right? Um, and, and because, and this is just something that I've mucked around and figured out, I don't, it's not necessarily a best practice by, by broad standards, but I feel like in all the different environments that I've been in, that's not present. This idea of reminding the clients, this is where we started, and this is where we brought you. Yeah. And, you know, it's not confrontational, not at all, mm -hmm. but it's still doing that extra step of education. And that's what I mean by I think it's our fault. We've, we've kind right. of forgotten how to do some of this stuff. We've forgotten how to argue with clients when they want to add extra ideas to a thing. It's like, no, your video is about one thing. Yeah. You want two Focus. things, that's a second video. Yep. And you don't have money for a second video, so pick one. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think we forget to do that too. Yeah, I think uh, you're right. It is, you do have to set those limits kind of like that. But I think, yeah, I think that's really good. That's really smart to show that process because I think that's something a lot of people don't understand. The people that aren't in video and it's easy for us to kind of forget what it's like to not know these things mm -hmm. um, and just assume everyone knows the stuff that goes into it. Um, and I think, yeah, so it's really good to show that process and because it's with digital work in general it's way less tangible than you know for example if you have someone that's like carving you a statue everyone knows that's a ton of work you know they realize that you, that you start with just a block of wood or marble or whatever and you have to like rough out the shape and carve in the you know they understand that process it makes sense it's tangible but like you're saying with digital things you could send and i've been in that position where i've sent a rough cut that is pretty polished yeah you know and, yeah. <laughs> and so when when it's called especially when it's called a rough cut and people see it and it's like even maybe got some color correction a little bit of mixing on it too um it's it kind of changes their perception of what it takes to actually make these things so like oh that's just, that's just rough cut that was easy you know like that's not too much. Well, I mean, I mean, the the rough cut died like in the nineties because I mean, 
at, 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 the, at, at the boutique that I worked at for the past three years or so, you know, because uh, Left Turn only split rent with Swizzle and 360. So there was like nine of us in the office and people that were smarter than me. So when when the creative director from Swizzle and I would, would get into the weeds and just bullshit about this stuff, uh, Chris pulled up um, a uh, Real Heroes uh, radio spot from Budweiser. Do you remember these? They were these snarky ads, the Real Heroes of Business or the Real Heroes of... Mm -hmm. And it would be um, like, like, hey, you... And, and I, I'm, I'm completely flubbing it, but it would be like... Uh, Hey, you tailgater. Yes, oh, okay. you, the yeah. one that has the grill out there blocking three parking spaces. Right. You know, taking up everything. You may be making it more difficult for people to park, but damn it, you bring the cheer. You know, <laughs> and it would be like these these kind of, there would be an edge to it. There'd be a sharpness and you could tell that kind of the writing voice is like, we're a little sick of your shit, but we know <laughs> this is kind of a common archetype that we can all celebrate. And then that would be the ad. The one that that, came, that that bubbled up for us back uh, a couple years ago was they had one of these Budweiser ones where it was um, uh, uh, the the market or the the uh, it, it basically took the piss out of people that didn't understand rough cuts. So okay. so it'd be oh, like wow. <laughs> so it'd be like um, uh, they they talk about yes you in 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 the in the branding department. A rough cut does not have the motion graphics, <laughs> but they're gonna ask for it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yep. You know, um, yep. it, it's worth you know whoever's listening to this. I'm 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 fumbling. Go YouTube it, and you'll pull <laughs> it up, and it's better. But uh, if you have Budweiser in the '90s making fun of people not understanding <laughs> rough cuts, and here we are today, it's like yeah. <laughs> we started to fail at this communication all, uh, before you and I got into the industry. Well, and I think part of it too is you know, like you're saying with that Budweiser thing where they said you, they're gonna ask for it anyways. I think that's part of it is because I was just tired of like I would send a rough cut. And I would even like caveat it and say like, yeah, th these are temporary it's at the graphics. Top of the email. Yeah, it's at these the top. is what's not in it. Exactly. <laughs> it's like this is temporary. This it's gonna change. It's gonna look better than this. Like yada yada. This is just to get a sense of the the pacing and the structure. And people still would reply and be like, well, can you update this graphic? I don't really like that. And it's like, yeah, I said I'm gonna update yeah. it. So I think that might be why it it's changed a little bit is because right. people are tired of getting that note back. And it's like, yes, I know. So they just take care of it right, at right. the top to avoid that. Well, I mean, I, I, I definitely, you know, for, for as much as I say it's, it's all our faults, it's like that's definitely happened to me as well where I'll be like, I'm sending you this video edit now unfinished so you know your money is being spent in a useful way. Mm -hmm. um, not to show you a finished thing in any way. Here are like some notes on why it's not finished. And then those communications would get messy sometimes or because like you would show the, the the toughest ones were when you would show them a a loose cut and some piece of it had to be removed right you know you'd be like we're going to look at the sequence and in the middle of it maybe there's like a beautiful sunset and then you go hey hey here's the rough cut everything is really cool and then you and then somebody goes oh hey at <clears throat> Minute two, we really need our orange logo to show up. That's just when it has to be there. Well, shit, that's right up against the sunset. So the sunset can't be there anymore mm -hmm. because it ha for whatever technical reason, it has to be at this point. Oh, where'd the sunset go? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's either or instead yeah. of stuff. <laughs> yeah. And then you get lost in these other conversations. And because nobody wants to actually sit down face to face or get on the phone, you're doing it all over email and it's, and it's really tough. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I do understand and appreciate that there was a lot of efficiency with it. But, man, I wish we could get better at arguing with our clients. Just yeah. arguing with them. Yeah. Bet, hey, because I think it's healthy. I think long-term it educates everyone. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't think an argument has to be a bad thing if you don't let the ego get in the way. It's just, no, no, I, I don't think this is a good position to hold. Right. Now, explain to me why it is a good position. Okay, well, okay, you've got a point. I see what you're getting under underneath there. The fear that you really have, we can address that. Here's some other ways that we can address it without running into the problems from the creative perspective. But, you know, that's extra work, and we're already being asked to pull in 10 other <laughs> skills anyway. And the thing, too, I think a lot of people that get into this industry 
you know, it's like people that are just passionate about like creating stuff, are interested in the tech of the video, the artistic side, whatever. And people that, like I've generally found people in this industry to be pretty chill and not yeah. confrontational and don't want to deal with that kind of stuff. They just like I just want to make my work and do the creative technical stuff and not worry about you know all that talking with the client like that's a lot of people i've talked to don't like interfacing with clients and they don't like all that kind of producer stuff that's what producers are for yeah your account <laughs> account managers yeah, account creative manager. directors all of that kind of stuff right. it's the loss of job roles yeah that used to be a shield that exactly. the practitioner had yeah and now with more people freelancing and smaller studios and agencies we are taking on those responsibilities more along with all the other stuff along with the technical stuff the sound mixing and color correction we're also expected to kind of have a bit of producing knowledge and being able to have that communication with the clients uh, and like budgeting and timesheets and all you know all the boring stuff mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah i mean i started i started working professionally in 2010 and i think i spent the first four years trying my damnedest to never have to talk to a client. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, because yeah. I was I was like that. It's just like it's not my thing. If you if you wanna make it if you wanna make a bad video, I don't care. You know, <laughs> and 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 that was probably uh part of the problem. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just being so chill about it where it's like it's not my baby. If you wanna do that, I'm just a hired gun here. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't care. And that's again because I, you you don't get brought up with these these account managers, these creative directors, and all this kind of stuff where that's their job, right? The producers to just pump your brakes, client. We, this is this is a process you are buying. This is an expertise you are buying. It it comes out this way, and we'll take care of your story. That's why you hired us. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so that's a soapbox that we stood on. <laughs> um, so. You're doing a lot of contracting work. Do you work out of the house? Do you go to a co-working space? Um, how, how do you manage your days? So currently I'm going, I've, well, the gig I just finished, I was going into their, the studio. So I was mm -hmm. going into their space. Um, and that I like that a lot more. <laughs> um, I have worked at home before, and I'm really bad at working at home. <laughs> Partly because my desk is in my room. And, yeah. you know, there's a whole thing about separating where you sleep and where you do your work. Uh, and at first, I with co-working spaces, I was like, why would anyone get like pay money for this space? You can just set up at home. And now I understand. I'm like, oh, yeah, it's really nice to have that separation. And also just be around other people. I think that's a, kind of a common thing with freelancers is you if you're totally working by yourself at home all day, it gets a little lonely. Mm -hmm. um, and I've kind of talked with some friends before about uh, moving into... A, a house with like four or five of your friends and have it be have like a room set up that's like a work yeah like a workshop yeah kind of yeah. yeah so like, like a, a combination of like a co-op and a, and a co-working space yeah that's that's how Matt's got his place set up oh okay cool. yeah because Matt lives with Ryan and, and a couple other people and they just have a dedicated work room yeah that yeah. seems really cool and I could honestly see that being more common as freelancers uh, are more common as well mm -hmm. and be it becomes more of the norm um, and then also it could be beneficial if you have someone that's like say a sound designer living with an editor living with a producer and then maybe you could all like collab on projects together and, yeah yeah and, and it's kind of like a studio but but not but not <laughs> yeah well yeah I, th I also think that individuals are getting a little bit more attention right now than you know those two three four man shops mm-hmm it seems easier for, for um, you know any you know anybody that's working on the account side where they're they're already up to their neck in stressful things to just go okay I don't have to vet a whole fucking crew I can just deal with one person yep you know um, do you have a, a a powerful computer at home do you just work off of a laptop uh, I do have a I have a custom PC um, right on it's pretty strong. Um, though I must say I hate Windows with a passion. <laughs> I wish I could work on Mac OS, um, and I don't want to set up a Hackintosh because that just seems like it has a million problems. But yeah, uh, that has actually been a real, real bane of my existence because I, I think I just work faster on Macs. I know that sounds weird, but it just like the the way that they're set up, 
just suits my workflow a lot better. Yeah. It feels so much smoother. Whenever I'm using Windows, it feels just clunky and it feels slow. Even though on paper, my custom PC is super strong and like better than the best Mac you could get. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it just feels outdated, the OS. And I really hope that one of these days, Mac will open up their hardware to be stronger and more modular um because i would oh, I love doubt that yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, i mean uh, i'm not i I'm, wish i wish i'm not holding my breath but <laughs> no yeah i was talking with a couple of folks that that what their plan is because they have such a strong preference for the interface that it'll be like a like a a terminal like you'll be in front of the computer will be just powerful enough to drive the software mm -hmm. and then everything gets shunted to a pc for renders and exports yeah, no, that I was kind of considering doing something like that. Mm -hmm. um, well, you have to buy two computers, right? That, it's, yeah, but that's the thing. Macs are so expensive. It's and then you also have to get essentially buy a, like a, a whole other rig. I guess you could set up like a rendering farm, but and then there, I know there's also issues with Macs communicating with PCs. Mm -hmm. um, and then plus, if you're like if you're doing something, so the main reason that I like having the PC is for using Octane Render in Cinema 4D. Because it takes advantage of the, the GPU, mm -hmm. and uh, you just can't really update that in a Mac. So I don't know if you could get that real-time feedback on a Mac without having a direct GPU that's powerful enough. Uh, yeah, I mean, what, like, what, when I've talked with people and we get really into, in the weeds on it, it's like, if you, if you set up a PC the right way... Um, you know, where your hard drives are fast enough and you've got the processing power and everything. Even if you're working in Premiere, you can be, you can have the project file on your, on your desktop, on your Mac. Mm -hmm. All of the assets are on the Premiere and it's working and it, and it will be as if you're working off of a SANS mm -hmm. um, or off of a network drive. And if, and if it's local and, you're, and you've set your connections right, it can be fast enough. And then if you've got that set up to be a render box and it slows down, you can always kick over to proxies. Yeah, um, you know, to kind of get your get a little bit of extra speed back, but I mean, at that, I think even to get that far, like there's a certain part of the professional group that's just like, nope, they're not going to be able to have either the like you say, you you're working in your room, mm -hmm. you may not have the physical space for two computers, you may not have the budget to invest in two computers, right. you may have the budget for two computers today, but are you going to have the budget to upgrade two computers five years from yeah, now? You know. So I don't know. Anyway, that's this has been a lot of fun. I but I we're we're at exactly an hour. Cool. <laughs> uh, Seems like a clock. good place yeah. to. Yeah. Um, so Alex, thanks for th thanks for being on the episode today. Is there anything that you want to like just button it up with or add or whatever's? I think we covered most of it. Thanks for having me on. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Um, yeah, I guess I'll see you next time. See you around. <laughs> All right. Bye, everyone. <laughs>